Hey everyone, Shane here. Let me tell you about my show coming up on November 24th, Saturday night over at Pops. We're calling it Riffs for Gifts. Me and my friend Lexi Schlimmer put this show together for uh, benefiting Toys for Tots. And we invited all along our friends Outrun the Fall, The Poor, Steeples, Monk and the People, um, The Matching Shoe, and Silent Hollow all performing live that evening on Saturday the 24th. Along with that, we'll have uh, some silent auction stuff. We'll have, uh, there's uh, there's rumors that Santa Claus might even be there. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and a whole lot more other things coming up. So get involved uh, with the show. You can find de- more details at popsrocks.com. And uh, come on out. It's a $10 donation at the door or $5 with a toy donation. So again, all this benefiting Toys for Tots. And it's going to be a great time. So come on out Saturday, November 24th, Pop Sauge, Illinois. Thanks, everyone. Hi, this is Lexi Sid. of Hess Van Schlemmer Metalworks and Art, home of the Schlemmer Metal Wolves. We are a small but furious family-run welding, fabrication, and metalworks shop with CNC capabilities and now full-scale powder coating operation. We bring unique, affordable quality art to life within the realm of practicality. Whether it's signs, sculptures, railings, shelves, furniture, or even just powder coat for your rims or your patio set, Give us a look, check us out on Facebook or Instagram, or call 618-670-5724. We are Hess Van Schlemmer Metalworks. That was terrible. Allie tried. Hey everybody, Shane Presley here, Rock Paper Podcast. Let me tell you about my friends over at Naked Vine. Located at 1624 Clarkson Road in Chesterfield, Missouri. Serving up all your favorite wine, whiskey, and local craft beers. Swing by and visit them Tuesday through Saturday with live music happening Thursday, October 25th, Kevin Babb. Friday, October 26th, The Warbuckles. And on Saturday, October 27th, The Scandaleros. I will return to Naked Vine with my singer-songwriter storytelling showcase on November 13th with Maddie Shell, Nick Gussman, and Sean Kimball. So do not miss that show. Uh, all these shows and full listing events can be found at nakedvine.net. Be sure to follow along with them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And uh, yeah, enjoy the show, everybody. Thanks for listening. Um, the podcast is kind of like a, it's like a radio show that's not on the radio. It's on it's on the internet. Does that make sense? Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> That's also like my mom. Uh, it makes it sound more confusing, doesn't it? Uh, it sounds like this. This is Justin Fisher from Smithley Productions, and you're listening to Rock Paper Podcast. Rock Paper Podcast. Hey, everybody. Shane Presley here, Rock Paper Podcast, coming to you from St. Louis, Missouri. Hanging out today at Smithley. Pro, is it Productions, right? Produ- everybody calls it Studios, but yes, yeah. it is officially Productions. Smith Lee Productions in Maplewood with Justin Fisher. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. Uh, yeah, man, I'm glad to be back here. Uh, you were kind of a part of it, uh, even though you weren't really on the mic, but uh, you helped uh, record my episode I did with uh, Neil and Adam a little while back. and. Yeah, which uh, that was our first time really like getting to meet. We'd been friendly online for a little while. The old uh, Facebook friends, but haven't met in yeah. real life thing. But we got to hang that day, and which uh, was a whole lot of fun. And and uh, Neil and Adam are great. And um, but that was uh, my first time over here at Smith Lee and getting to check out everything you have going on here and stuff. But uh, I uh, I thought this would be fun to kind of get to talk a little bit more about that and uh, some other projects you're working on and things. So. Uh, but uh, tell me a little bit more, man. How like how do we get started here at uh, Smith Lee when you know well, this stuff? Like, I've been, well, me personally, I've been here for fifteen years now, which uh, is is fairly rare nowadays for a, a an engineer at a studio that's not like an owner. You know, you have an owner of a studio that might own it for decades, but you know, you don't see many engineers right. <laughs> at studios for like long periods of time. I don't know why that is. It's just kind of, well, I should say that, 
you know, just being a staff engineer at a studio now is kind of rare in mm-hmm. general. And, and anytime I tell people, yeah, I'm, I'm like a staff engineer, I work at a studio like 40, 40 or whatever hours a week, and uh, people look at me like I'm weird, <laughs> you know, because it's just such a rarity now. You have a lot of freelancers, you have a lot of people that like own and operate studios, but not many like commercial facilities that have staff engineers that are employees. It's it's not, and not just in St. Louis here. It's 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 kind of across the board. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, yeah. So I've been here about 15 years. Um, the studio itself. Uh, we're going to actually be celebrating our 40th year oh, wow. uh, next year. So um, not in this location, but just in business. Uh, we've been in this specific location in Maplewood since 1985, uh, but in business since 79. Yeah. So we're probably going to have a nice uh, party or something nice, you know, yeah. coming up pretty soon. So that'll be cool. For sure. That sounds fun. Yeah. Oop. It's, uh, you know, it's it's rare for a studio to be in business that long and you gotta these days come up with all kinds of ways to stay in business you know there's a a handful of studios that will stay in business by just doing music but it's more and more rare you know usually somebody's got some sort of side thing or alternate business method if if it's selling t-shirts or you know, like Gaslight with a venue or, you know, subsidizing the studio with another business venture. You know, you ask any any studio owner and that's a common response, you know, that they'll have something else going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do too. We've got actually a sister company uh, called Emerge Interactive that does, you know, web marketing and programming and all that stuff. So it's it, something that most people do. Yeah. So... As far as uh, for you uh, personally, I mean, is this uh, something you've been a part of your life for a long time? I mean, as like, I guess you I mean, obviously you went to school and stuff, but like, was it always wanting to be involved in music for when you were early on? Yeah, for the most part. Um, you know, like most people, you ask a lot of engineers and they'll tell you that you know, they were a musician, wanted to record their band yeah. or whatever. And for me, it was it was pretty similar scenario. I was in high school and kind of was thinking of doing architecture and then... I don't know. I, d- I don't even know how it came about. You know, I was, this was early, mid 90s and playing, you know, Nirvana covers and right. <laughs> stuff like that and alternative bands and things. And, you know, started recording things on a cassette deck. And back then it was so different because the recording equipment was astronomically expensive and very cost prohibitive for anybody. So I'm sitting here with a dual well cassette deck recording on one and then bouncing it over to the other and just like doing the sound on sound kind of thing. And, you know, tape machines were for rich people basically, (laughs) you know, and uh, there wasn't much else. And kids now they've got, you know, their laptop and a hundred bucks worth of software and they're good to go. You know, we didn't have that back then and it's so different now. Uh, But yeah, that's, that's kind of how I got started and, um, went to Webster as, you know, the only game in town for audio, unless you go to another college out of state, there's really not, well, there is now, um, we got like EI, um, what is it? The S I, I always confuse it with the, the union S C I U S I U E. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They've got a program too, but yeah, Webster is one of the only games in town. So that's, I went there and graduated with a four-year degree in audio production. So, um, yeah, it's been uh, something I've wanted to do for quite a while, I would say. Right. Um, most people that get into it are musicians and, and get into it to record their own stuff, I would say, a lot mm-hmm. of people. Yeah. So, was that, are you still playing? Or are you... Are you uh, um, yeah, not as much as I used to. Yeah. Um, I you know, played in bands since I was 15 and, uh, it, they were usually always mine. I, the only band that I actually joined was Murder Happens that I played in for, oh, five years, I think. Uh, and then I left that band, I guess it's been, shoot, six years ago now. Um, 
because I had a second kid and, you know, life was getting crazy and hectic. And so I left that band, but, you know, I was singing and playing guitar there for a while. That was a lot of fun because, like, harder rock, industrial metal stuff has always kind of been what I prefer to play live or with a like an electronic element to it. Um, my personal band that's now basically just kind of a side project now, Glitch Factor, it's the same kind of stuff. It's like electronic rock hybrid stuff. But Murder Happens, you know, I was doing that for a while. Um, and that was that same vein, more heavily on the industrial side. Mm-hmm. And uh, But yeah, I, I had to leave just because of life. And sure. now I'm like sitting here six years later going, man, I really miss being on the stage, yeah. you know? <laughs> It's there's that itch, and sure. a lot of people go through it where they quit for a while, and then they're like, Ugh, "I got, I got to do something." So I'm sitting here thinking, like, "What's my next thing gonna be?" You know, and probably something similar. I'm I'm thinking of maybe doing like um like a electric punk rock kind of thing, okay. you know, like a grimy electronic kind yeah. of project is my my idea. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that would have been a perfect time to drop in uh, some the urge uh, when you said it was getting crazy, getting hectic and stuff. So play that little clip. Yeah, there you go. And I'll talk to Steve. And yeah, see if he's okay. Get with clearance that. on that. And... <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, man. I so uh, you, you you've been here. Uh, you said fifteen years. Now? Fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. So Almost what? Sixteen. I know. Um, I mean, I walk the halls over here with you, and like looking at. Some of the uh, great records that have been recorded in this uh, building and everything else, and like, yeah. uh, uh, which you care to talk about some of those you've been a part sure. of? Or? Um, like most recently, um, let's see, I, I did a lot of a couple records with Blackfast. Um, I've been working on a record with Valley, uh, another metal band for a while. Um, that's a, a second EP that's that should be out pretty soon. Um, what else have I finished recently? Oh, he's not really super well known, which is unfortunate. But uh, there's this guy by the name of Craig Edelin, and he's his group. Well, it's not really a group because it's pretty much just him at this point. But it's his project's called Sewn Robe, and we just finished uh, a record recently that he hasn't put out yet. But oh man, it's so good. It's like early Smashing Pumpkins. Okay, and it's just fantastic. And I can't wait till that drops because that'll be a really great record um what else have i finished oh i'm working on a record with planet eater been doing a lot of metal stuff recently is that what you you kind of lend towards um or are you like partially a, yeah. yeah um that a lot of like electronic rock stuff which i'm into and right. you know I, I do everything you have to do everything mm-hmm. you know um you can't turn down projects <laughs> really yeah. um but that doesn't mean just because i like a certain type of music that i gravitate towards it because i don't i couldn't do the same thing all the time uh it would get boring mm-hmm. um like 10 years ago i was doing a lot of collegiate acapella like think of the movie pitch perfect that right. kind of stuff and oh man i at the end of like a full day of tuning people's vocals going ba 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 I wanted to shoot myself <laughs> like I had about 10 groups yeah. that I was working on all from Washu a couple from SLU and um almost luckily for me a lot of that work dried up <laughs> because a lot of them started doing things on their own or recording in their dorm rooms or whatever and I was kind of happy that I mean it was a a big payday that we kind of lost but I was kind of happy it happened because it's like man I I want to do other things besides this and there's other there's producers out there that like just work on that and i couldn't do that i want to do other stuff right like mix it up you know so it's good to work on on other projects but yeah i I do get a decent amount of metal and uh some hard rock um i've been working on like i said some electronic kind of stuff um this uh band coil of sin that i just finished a, a cover record of he does like covers of a lot of like industrial covers of certain songs, which is a really cool record that just came out. And uh, Vela Uniform, which is uh, Brenda Mary's band, uh, who she was in Murder Happens With Me. Um, we're finishing her record right now, um, which also has Paul Wood from Murder Happens. 
Um, so that'll be a cool project. That's coming out pretty soon. But this week, uh, we got Ilphonics in all week yeah. um, recording another record. This will be hmm my fourth with them, I think. Okay. Um, I love those guys. Yeah. And so fun. they're going to be in here actually tomorrow for a week. And uh, I guess I can spill the beans because this won't air f- <laughs> until we're done tracking yeah. probably. But uh, so they're pulling in uh, David Bowie's old producer, Tony Visconti, Whoa. to work on that record, which will be a lot of fun. Nice. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. And then uh, they're a great example of a little bit of everything because – they do a little bit of everything. There's a uh, you know there's a little rock, a little hip hop, you know a little, you know some jazzy sound, sound sometimes, and you know there's a lot of different things coming through their uh, through what Ilphonics is. So. Yeah, um, I I love working with those guys. It's you know always something new, um, and it's it's I don't want to say it's challenging to work on, but it is to a certain extent because you've got all these influences that come together and. It's it's fun to oh here's another you know punk band that guitar bass and drums right you know and it gets a little formulaic at times and with this stuff it's like you know we did like a flamenco song or you know yeah. it's like all kinds of crazy different different things for sure um, so that's a lot of fun to work on that so yeah do you uh, as a like a producer and stuff like do you ever like go recruiting at all like to you know or find something like how or is it pretty much you let your work uh, do the, the work for you? The kinda? work hustle. Yeah. <laughs> you have to, to a certain extent. Right. Um, you know, people, it's a lot of word of mouth. Right. So hopefully people come to you and you don't have to do as much. Or you got a lot of repeat mm-hmm. clients and things like that. But yeah, it's, I mean, there's definitely some like, you got to, it's a little slow this month. Let's right. go out and start pulling things in. And, you know, like I was saying earlier, you, music doesn't pay the bills alone for us. So we do a lot of um, – I do a lot of film mixing, um, web videos and stuff like that, you know, corporate stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a, a good amount of that that comes through too. Well, I saw there was a, one of the things on the wall about uh, from a video game too, right? You got Yeah, that. we did um, – well, you probably know uh, Phyllis from The Office – Sure. Um, whose actual name is Phyllis. Yeah. And she lives, well, partially lives here in St. Louis and then goes from here to L.A. But um, she was in a couple of years ago doing uh, voiceover for Inside Out. The Oh, yeah. Um, not that game specifically, but the Disney Infinity. Um, there's her character Sadness was in yeah. that game. So we did all of this audio for that. I've done a, a WWE game. Um, a couple things for Lucas Arts. Uh, rest in peace, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, but that's pretty neat though to be, and especially like just to have some talents like that come in that want to record here and things yeah. and stuff. So yeah, the, um, we've got uh, Ken Page. Um, he's a huge like Broadway actor. Does a lot of stuff with the Muni, but he did the voice of uh, Oogie Boogie for Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, and very cool. Yeah. They they're always doing stuff with that character, so he's in a, a good amount. He's a great guy and super talented. What probably literally one of the coolest sessions I've ever done in my life was with him because they had to they had changed like a couple words in all of his songs for something for the Disney parks, and he had to record re-record all of his songs from that movie. And I got to you know just sit there and watch him do his thing and yeah. oh man that was that was really cool All right he's yeah. like he doesn't sound any different now than he did you know that's 25 years ago i think that movie came out now yeah yeah that's uh that's one of my wife's favorites she's yeah. uh she's hooked on it uh has to buy everything jack and everything on it like, so <laughs> yeah she's a big big fan yeah well he gets a kick out of it that you know Back then, it didn't seem like it was that big a deal, and like still to this day, he's doing stuff for that yeah. film, which is crazy. He, we did a, a operation game, except with Oogie Boogie is on the table, and you like pulling bugs out of him. So <laughs> right. we got to record all of him going, "My bugs, my bugs." <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. Nice. Uh, well, um, so yeah, if you uh, if you're in the need of uh, recording and everything else, you can come 
on over here to Smithley Productions yeah. and uh, and we'll take care of you. Uh, but along with all that, like uh, you, we wanted to also talk about you are a part of a, a film. Uh, what, I guess you, what you directed it? I uh, uh, yeah, you, I did produce a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Director, producer, editor, uh, you know, general everything kind of. I mean, had a lot of help. Right. But you know, the ideas all came from me to to pull this film off. Right. Um, gateway sound so the uh the idea kind of came about with um two people that have been in the st louis recording scene uh that are talkers <laughs> they talk a lot my boss dave smith and another engineer that used to work at a studio here in town one of the biggest studios here in town technosonic i now teaches at webster and does engineering too Uh, Bill Schulenberg. And so Bill was by the studio one day and they were, him and Dave were just telling war stories, you know, for probably an hour. (laughs) And I'm just sitting there listening and I'm like, man, somebody should really like document this stuff. You know, some really great stories. So that kind of planted that seed for me to start the film. It's like, man, I should just go around and talking to all these engineers around St. Louis and kind of get the history of recording in St. Louis. Yeah. Um, So that's how the whole thing started. And I, you know, I was doing that, getting a lot of people to talk to and uh, eventually just kind of grew. And I'm thinking to myself, like, why am I limiting myself by making this about St. Louis? Well, I knew why. It was it was budget. Yeah. You know, I'm like, well, I can't I don't have the, the clout or the money or the wherewithal to, like, go around the country and start interviewing people and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, wh- why not? <laughs> so I, I ran a Kickstarter campaign, which was fairly successful and went, you know, to uh, Nashville, Memphis, uh, L.A., uh, Asheville, North Carolina, and just talked to engineers around the country, producers around the country and some musicians and stuff. And, of course, a lot of people here in St. Louis because we've got a lot of talent that people aren't always aware of. You know, there's a lot of St. Louis people that are, you know, really great engineers and great musicians and all that stuff just right here in St. Louis. So, of course, I talked to a bunch of people here, too. Um, Richard Fortas, who's in Guns N' Roses, and Steve Ewing from The Urge, um, Christine Young. Um, so I started with a lot of people like that um, and then, you know, talked to people like Steve Lillywhite, who's done U2 and 30 Seconds to Mars and Dave Matthews Band and countless others uh steve albini did nirvana and the pixies and a bunch of people like that i uh i I actually uh so you sent me a link i got to i I didn't finish it but i got most uh most of the watch most of the film and um but that's what i i took quickly noticed right away was like i felt i I connected a lot to it because it felt like a lot of why I do what i'm doing with the podcast and it's been hearing you say that today with the the there was I was around all these different great conversations all the time, and I'm like, man, why don't we just start recording these? Like, you know, it's like <laughs> this is this is very fun and entertaining, and I think people would get a kick out of it. So, yep. so it was a lot of why I, you know, kind of wanted to step into this, you know, format also. Yeah. Um, and I had all these talented friends I wanted to showcase and put them out there. So. Yep. Uh, but yeah, and then like watching the film, like it's a lot of that. There was well, there was also another cool part about it was like. You know, I've been doing my show now for whether four and a half years or something, and so I, there was a lot of my friends from the show are in the film. So like that was another nice little, yeah. uh, you know, thing. It was Connection. pretty, yeah, for sure. It was, it was just cool to see yep. all my uh, that you had a bunch of my buddies on here. So yeah, um, yeah. I got uh, obviously Steve's been uh, a huge part of this. Uh, I think he was episode five uh, on oh, the okay. show, so he's been a, a big supporter since the very beginning. And, Great. Um, I was telling the story the other day, but the first time I booked, uh, I just, I've been doing these like birthday shows in the summer to mm-hmm. celebrate the podcast. And like, um, first one I threw was over at Steve's hot dogs. Yeah. Uh, digs, uh, he was doing these like acoustic brunch shows over there. And I was like, kind of piggybacked on that idea. I was like, Hey Steve, how about I do one of these and, you know, bring in some bands. He's like, yeah. And he's like, uh, he's like, Oh, uh, I'll play. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, yeah, I was like, you know, was like, the very first party I throw, and Steve Ewing offers to, to awesome. play, and I'm like, so, 
Uh, I got him and Adam uh, Hansborough played uh, a bunch of Urge songs uh, cool. acoustic for me, and I was like, it was just awesome, man. It was like, but anyway, he's become a great friend and and one of the coolest guys around town yeah, for Steve, sure. Steve's so. great. Yeah, but yeah, seeing Richard, um, Doug from uh, Gravity Kills is in there. Yeah, like a bunch of my uh, favorite people. So yeah, um, and which I guess I'm sure. Uh, was that pretty cool for you talking to Doug and stuff like? Cause... Yeah, well, Doug, Doug and I have been friends for a while, yeah. so it's always you know a little easier to get interviews when you right. <laughs> know people ahead of time. And that was that was a bit of the challenge of of putting this whole film together was just getting people in the first place. But you know, it's it's great because in doing this, I got to talk to so many people that I'm you know fans of. Right. You know, or heroes of mine, which was, I mean, talking to Steve Lillywhite was freaking fantastic. You know, unfortunately, his was the only interview that was done via Skype yeah. <laughs> because he's he's in Indonesia now. So wow. that one wouldn't have been practical. But yeah, um, yeah Steve's just phenomenal talent. And um, I, I, Steve Lillywhite, I should uh, preface because I thought, you know, I might need to rename this film the steves because <laughs> there are like so yeah. many people named steve and this yeah. steve higdon who used to work here uh so oh, yeah a lot of people named <laughs> steve <laughs> oddly enough in this film yeah. but yeah it's it's uh it's interesting going about um so many people have the same stories or the same insight is, is in terms of like what's happening to them in the the music business and how they're approaching things now compared to how they approached it earlier. But, you know, one one thing I kind of gained from this too is like it's not just this industry. It's mm-hmm. there's so many other industries that are experiencing the exact same thing the record, recording business is in terms of uh, changes of technology affecting how business is done and, you know, generally the – the word professional is becoming blurred, you know, and I know people in the film business definitely see it. People in uh, print definitely see it. Uh, journalism and, you know, all these different businesses where just things have been done a certain way for a long time. And within a sh- very short period of time, they're not, you know, so how do we, how do we readdress that, but also how do we adjust our business model to make sure that we can still survive, you know? Right. Is there, so is this, uh, so I guess like you, you had the conversation, you are you, you were part of the conversation with your boss there and like you're saying like this was all happening and you kind of put that idea out there like, did you just start kind of uh, then start writing down some ideas that you think that you wanted to discuss to when you start filming this or, and, yeah, or did it kind of evolve as you were going? Both. I mean, I had a series of questions that I wanted answers to. And, you know, the one thing I didn't want to do, it, you know, with certain documentaries, you can always tell, well, these people have an agenda from the beginning and I'm going to talk to all these people and I'm going to cut it so that these people say what I want them to say to right. fit my agenda of how I think this film should go. And I wanted to make sure I didn't do that. Um, you know, it may seem like that because so many people had the same answers, you know, but um, I, I asked a lot of people a lot of the same questions and that's just kind of what came out. But, you know, I talked to a few people about the idea of the film. It's like, well, you know, I don't, I don't want it to seem all like doom and gloom because I've, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about this stuff and it's like, oh, the sky is falling kind of stuff. And I didn't want it to exclusively be that way. So it's, it's shaped in a way to where there's different perspectives from different people. You know, I, I wanted to make sure, okay, let's talk to people that own studios. Let's talk to engineers and producers, but let's also talk to musicians that, don't use studios or don't use studios anymore or never used a studio and get, you know, both sides of the coin to make sure I'm covering all my bases. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, Oh, you know, studios are dying. We don't go there anymore. And let's uh, throw in the towel. You know, I didn't want the whole thing to be like that. Mm -hmm. Well, I talked to, I talked to a lot of, you know, again, going back to what I was saying earlier, I did a lot of these to my friends and a lot of the, I talked to a lot of bands and I talked to a lot of musicians 
And, uh, and that's a lot of what I bring up too, is like, uh, so, cause some people are doing, uh, I just had a group on the other day. They did uh, their whole record from their basement in like a home recording studio type of space. And it sounds great. And, and they, uh, you know, and, it, but it's like some bands need that producer and engineer to help kind of, uh, push them somewhere or do different things. So like, I don't know that there's any right or wrong. It's just kind of what caters best to your particular yeah. you know, situation. Um, but uh, I know uh, a lot of bands that love going to the studio because they get the product they get, and like that's what they—that's the sound they're looking for, and that's yeah. what they want. And yeah, I won't ever sit here and and say just a blanket statement. I will do it better than you right. will do it because I know that a my production technique isn't always going to match their aesthetic. Uh, B, people might not like the vibe of being in a studio. You know, hopefully they do, and that's kind of why people come. Mm -hmm. But that's not always the case. Some people are really uncomfortable being in a recording studio, and that's fine. I'm not going to force that on them, and I can't. Yeah. Um, so some people get a lot better performances at home. Sure. Um, and I've started actually pushing people to do this like hybrid method where, you know, this band that I mentioned earlier, Planet Eater, we've got like a great back and forth method where uh, they came in, they tracked drums here because, you know, nine times out of 10, tracking drums at home is not going to sound great because of the, the acoustics, but it's hard. Tracking drums is not easy if you, if you want it to sound good. Right. So they tracked the drums here. And then I gave them those files. They recorded the performances of guitars and bass, brought that back here, and then we, you know, played the the performances out through their rigs with, you know, really good mics and gear and all that stuff. I gave them those files after we recorded guitars, then they tracked vocals, and then they sent it back here for mix. So it's this back and forth thing, and it works out awesome. Yeah. You know, because they're not wasting time i don't want to say wasting but they're not spending hours in the studio like oh, i didn't get the solo right mm -hmm. you know here's take 85 of the same solo you know and they can just be comfortable and get that part done at home so that's that's the expensive part it's like oh i didn't really learn my parts the way i should have so we're gonna waste an hour like working on this part again and you don't have that scenario mm -hmm. there you know i feel like and again, this is my perspective. I don't, I've never been, uh, in a studio as far as, uh, performing and, or, or, you know, vice versa or anything, but like, I, but I do feel like, uh, the, as I was doing like a home recording, I feel like the biggest thing would be that the, the I mean, it's got pros and cons to both, but the, you have time, but that's also the part of the problem is you have unlimited time. <laughs> yes. You know, you can, you, you have to sit there, you can sit there reworking it over and over and over. Yep. And, but I feel like sometimes in a studio, you're like forced to get creative and you get, cause you're, you know, you're, you know, you're on the clock and you gotta, you know, you want to get in and get out. And, uh, but it's sometimes it gets some of that stuff, creates some of the best stuff, you know, it's yeah. like, um, so I don't know. Like, again, there's, there's no right or wrong yeah, to any exactly. of it, but uh, it's it's interesting though. But I guess uh, I do um, I do feel like you know like saying like sometimes with uh, doing it by yourself like it, that's the part of the problem yeah. too is you can take it could take forever because you you're your own worst critic. You're gonna yep. sit there listening to it over and over, thinking oh I could do that better or whatever. And one of my favorite quotes in the film was uh, uh, Sean Payne from this band Cyanotic up in Chicago. He's he's like talking about how. He had a studio in his house and he's like, yeah, you know, I can sit here and work on stuff and then go, well, I kind of want to go get a pizza right now. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, he stops working for yeah. a while. And uh, so, yeah, it can be day. I hate working at home. Right. I don't get anything done. For sure. You know, I sit there and oh, get on Facebook for a minute <laughs> and then right. I'll, you know, do a little bit of work. Oh, my kids need me. Okay, do a little bit more work. And there's just, I think there's a study done a while ago where, if you get distracted from the task that you're on, it takes you like 10 or 15 minutes to get back on track to what you were doing. And I totally agree with that. You know, it takes a while to get back into the swing of right. that creative process. And that's the thing about being in a studio. It's like you're you're hyper-focused on that task and you don't have a lot of things to distract you from doing yeah. that thing. Whereas at home, it's like, yeah, you're not paying, but 
you it could take you two years to get a record finished, which mm-hmm. isn't always the best thing. And I, I've been encouraging bands for a while now. It's like nobody wants to wait that long for you to finish a record. They're going to forget about you. You know, you need to be constantly putting material out to with all the other stuff that they have to pay attention to. You know, a lot of people are more focused on Netflix and they're focused on your band. You need to be, hey, I'm here, right. you know, constantly letting them know. Like the days of, of a, you know, three to five years going by before Nine Inch Nails puts a record out is, <laughs> well, they're still doing it, but right. it's not a good idea. But they can because they're you know, that status where where people will wait. But, you know, let's face it, if you're a local band and, you know, you take three years to make a record, well, a lot of people have probably moved on and they might be, oh, hey, those guys put out a record. That's cool. And, you know, but I keep telling people just constantly feed that information, that media to them. And unfortunately today, it's like you almost have to have a video with everything. Which, you know, it, it's good and bad. It's it's bad from a financial standpoint. Right. Because um, a lot of people can't afford to make a really good-looking video for every song that they put out. But people almost expect it. You know, in, in the day where YouTube is the primary place where people listen to music, you almost have to have a video for all the stuff that you put out. Yeah. So yeah, it's least... sad, but <laughs> that's right. the truth. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I do appreciate it, but not having enough visuals to go with it and things, even if it's like a, just a lyric video or mm-hmm. something. But, um, but yeah, we definitely you got to do a lot of tricks to try to keep everybody's attention today. Yeah. Well, so. and I think it's unfortunate, like when you have certain media outlets like Facebook or, or Instagram or whatever, that there is no way to just play audio, which I never did understand. You know, you have to have a visual element if you're going to upload audio to those platforms. So it kind of forces people mm-hmm. to do that. Right. You, uh, what was the biggest, like, um, thing you learned doing this, uh, but being between audio recording and everything or, or and film, like as far as like becoming a, a being a filmmaker and stuff? Now? Um, well, ooh, I mean, I'm learning stuff every day. Right. Like I teach over at Webster too and. Um, I'm telling students constantly, like, I'm not, you know, I'm teaching you these things, but I'm not going to sit here and pretend I'm always going to know more than you about any given topic. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's always like constantly, you know, talking to other engineers and learning new tricks or methods, or, you know, it might just be one of those things where you knew something and then you stop doing it for a while and then you're like, oh yeah, well doing it that way made it so much easier. Why did I stop doing that? It's like, right. You're like renewing that interest in a certain way of doing things. But you know, it's funny, like the most important life skills from an engineering standpoint, I always remember go back to is like just dealing with people and not so much the technical aspect of it. You know, you, <laughs> engineering is just as much like psychology as it is turning knobs and mm-hmm. things like that. So that's the one thing I absolutely love about my job is if I were an accountant or something like that, I wouldn't have those interactions with some really fucking cool people, <laughs> right. you know? It's like day in and day out, I, I get to deal with really cool people. Sure. That's the that's probably the biggest thing I hear when I, when I hear people talking about different recording studios one it's like you're saying the the experience the vibe the everything that goes into it but it's the the hangout with the producer and stuff that that's what they love the most like they they just they're they naturally just enjoy the company of the people that are they're working with so yeah. uh, so i mean yeah like i said that's a big part of it is being having those building those relationships up and stuff it's not it's a lot more than just the turning the knobs it's yeah. uh so very uh, much so. Yeah, and that's probably why you get those repeat customers. Oh, like totally. You're about yeah, them. I mean, a good portion of my clients are are people that I've been working with for a long time. And, right. And you know, there's, I I get some bands might want to like take a different approach with a record or have a totally different sound on a certain record. Um, but at the same time, if you're like always dealing with somebody new, you don't you don't have that like unsaid communication where you both know what each other wants, you know, it was, which comes with working with an artist for an extended period of time. You're like, 
I know what the setup is. I know what sound you're looking for. Um, we don't have to second guess each other. You know, it's just, it comes naturally. Yeah. As, as far as, uh, the, the filmmaking, is, it, is that something you want to continue to pursue? I mean, or is this, <laughs> that's a great question. I, uh, said to myself after I finished it, I will never make a documentary ever again. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's yeah. a lot of freaking work. I would love to, but I'd have to be paid yeah. for it. I think, or like m actually make money doing it. Um, but it was, it was a awesome experience. A totally awesome experience and I wouldn't trade it for the world and I got to do some things I've never done I got to talk to people I've never talked to I got to go places I've never gone to before um, but man I there are certain things I wish I would have known up front that nobody tells you or, or they don't know themselves you know like all the paperwork involved <laughs> and all the releases and all you know all the stuff that you should really do ahead of time that you're talking like right now I'm talking to a distributor about getting this film out there and hopefully within a matter of months, you know, we'll see it on all the major streaming platforms. And, uh, you know, there's so much paperwork that has to be done. It's like, man, if I was doing this from the beginning of the process, <laughs> I wouldn't be like cramming it all in right now. Right. You know, so I would, I would love to, but the right idea would have to come along. Yeah. How many hours do you think you filmed? Oh, I, I purposefully didn't calculate. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Not just because, like, I I figured if I would if I would write them down, I I wouldn't want to know that right. information. <laughs> yeah. So I I deliberately did not keep track of it. Um, I mean, I probably got maybe two hundred hours just in the edit. Yeah, and that's not counting all the you know time spent shooting sure. and everything like that. So well, I'm sure, like, I mean, probably something like that too, where it's like. You're you're learning the hard way doing it by yourself the first time you know yeah and stuff like you're learning as you're going and everything how you want to do this and and everything but um you would obviously the second time probably be you've learned from yeah, all that and exactly. hope it's going to be better but it's, I don't know it's exciting though to kind of take on a new project a new adventure and and like I'm saying getting to getting to get out around and see the little bit of the world and getting to meet all these people and stuff like I mean I'm thankful every day that this this podcast has introduced me to so many people that totally. I would have never met otherwise and stuff. So, yeah, well, that's, that was the best part about it. It's just, you know, talking to, talking to people that I wouldn't have normally have even made an introduction to, mm -hmm. you know, but you know, certain people were just totally cool with it. Like, Oh yeah, let's, you know, get together and not a problem. You know, other people's got a point of entry, be it a manager or a sure. assistant or whatever that makes it a little more challenging, but it's so funny. Like with a lot of, quote unquote famous people you know you would have no problem talking to that person directly at all but getting through to their people it can be a big challenge sometimes. right oh yeah you uh you mentioned distribution um so hopefully we'll have that coming uh soon but there is a big opportunity you can come uh be a part of the screening here uh, we have a date in St. Louis at uh, what, November 3rd, yep. KDHX uh, at the stage uh, room there. Correct. Yeah. So, so you can- the St. Louis International Film Festivals in the the general thing it's playing. In. Right. Have you, uh, uh, so yeah, grab tickets, uh, come on out to that. Uh, it's going to be a neat opportunity. Are you uh, are you doing anything else involved with that uh, as far as the, with the film festival? Are you doing any- like, um, You know, I've, I've worked on a handful of films that are in it. You know, right. doing audio. I mean, for that as stuff. far as like Q and A or any doing any kind of like um, thing like that. Yeah, I'm not sure if they're doing a Q and A for this or not. Right. Uh, I just think it's that'd possible. be, be kind of cool. Yeah, to get to talk about it too with the audience and. Yep. Um, you uh, has it been in any other uh, festivals or things around? Yeah. Well, part of the reason it's in the St. Louis International Film Festival because it was um, premiered at the St. Louis Filmmaker Showcase, which is the same people, Cinema St. Louis. Um, and then, uh, which had also won best documentary and, uh, best editing, which I was super surprised at because I've never edited a film <laughs> right. in my life. And, uh, so I was ecstatic about that, but because it went through that process, it automatically got entered into the international film festival, which is cool. Yeah. And I, I don't know, uh, I don't know much about that world at all. Uh, but I did was, I was kind of a part of it a little bit. My buddy, um, 
he had a film and they they do uh was part of the film festival as well and stuff and but i didn't uh i, didn't, well, I wasn't aware you know i just not really into that i mean I'm, i love film and everything but yeah. i'm not really into the the festivals and stuff like that but i didn't realize that st louis film Fe- international film festival is a it's a big deal yeah. like i mean so just uh they just sold out recently john goodman's coming in to do oh, yeah. uh, the big lebowski he's yeah. gonna be there for that i was mad that i missed the opportunity yeah. to get tickets for that i was, I was very disappointed in myself i was uh uh, I was kind of keep hoping they keep an eye on maybe they'll announce a second yeah. one or something. But uh, uh, that's one of my favorites, uh, Big Lebowski. Yep. Actually, we just went to the um, anniversary uh, screening okay. at the theater and stuff <laughs> and saw it and and uh, which was really great because like I learned. I mean, I've watched the movie several times and I've seen a lot of stuff. But like, I guess it was part of like Turner Classic Movies uh, yep. kind of. So they had like the I forget the guy's name, but the the host and he was like talking mm-hmm. about it and. And shared a lot of information that I didn't wasn't aware of really about the movie, like uh, just stuff like about how uh, uh, the uh, the festival and stuff where they all you know the uh, I forget what town it's in, but where they they have like Lebowski Fest and where yeah, okay. everybody, everybody dresses up as like <laughs> characters and it's like and like uh, all I think all the film people of the film have over the last several years have made appearances up there yeah. and like. Jeff Bridges band the uh, the abiders have played up there and nice. stuff. And I'm like... still mad at myself to this day. I was at Savers one day, and uh, they had a sweater that looked just like oh, yeah. the the dude's sweater. Yeah. And I passed it up. I'm like, what am I gonna do with this? Right. I don't need it. And I pass it up. And then as soon as I got home, I'm like, man, I should have bought that. <laughs> so I literally went back, and it was gone. Oh, <laughs> I was <yeah>. so mad. <laughs> <laughs> like oh, man, I could have been the dude for Halloween one well, yeah, year or yeah. something. You never know. Get a white Russian. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, that uh, such a classic though, man. That movie uh, still makes me laugh so yep. hard every time I watch it, and it's ju- uh, the amazing dialogue. And um, I just, uh, I'm a big fan of that, and all those people involved in it. But yep. and I, I love movies, and I love like just uh, you know being a part of all that. But like. I don't know, like, I don't know if I could do what you did, like, actually be, you know, take it on and be a director and editor and all a lot that. Of, a lot of help, yeah. you know, that's for sure. And I, I spent so much time just doing research, mm-hmm. too, you know. I I didn't want it to look like an amateur production, and, you know, you I had a lot of really good people help out on it, um, from shooting to helping with the edit to color and all that stuff and, and really helped kind of solidify the whole thing but i also kind of it's the same with engineering you you practice your craft you research your craft you hone your craft and i I did the same thing with the film just kind of like okay what do i need to know about cameras what do i need to know about lighting and all that stuff now i still cringe every time i see the scenes that i shot compared (laughs) to the ones that (laughs) people that helped shot but you know it could have been worse right What's the what's the biggest hurdle you think you you came across to uh, when you were doing all this? Like, um, was that, you mentioned budget and stuff with and all that was like, is that yeah. probably the biggest thing? Is just trying uh, to. I would say I was my own hurdle, yeah. really. You know, if I had known at the beginning of it, like, I shouldn't have limited myself. You know, I from the very beginning, I should have just said, "Hey, I'm going to make it this story." Mm-hmm. And then I, I would have had more time to, you know, reach out to different people for interviews and, um, you know, not restricted myself to St. Louis at the very beginning, which I did. You know, it reached out past that, which is good. But, you know, if I would have had this mindset from the get go, it's like, well, this can be bigger than I think it can. Um, I would have had some uh, some other people that I, I wanted to reach out or had more time to to get mm-hmm. um, because there are a couple people that just like I was close to getting, but the timing just didn't work out, you know? Right. And this is, this has been a project for four, four years. years. Yes. It's pretty wild, man. Yeah, it is. I just had to talk a, a little bit ago. Speak. It was also regarding film. My friends uh, just did a film called Efflictum. Mm-hmm. And started as a web series, and like they were doing by themselves, putting up on YouTube, and then, and then they were kind of gotten doing like a 
a mini series kind of thing and then it got into become an actual film feature film and like so they kind of they reshot it several times and kind of the stories are kind of adapted in different things is to become yeah. what it is today but uh you know that's kind of what it was kind of cool talking to them about doing a you know actually taking on the project themselves and doing this and yeah um but i think they've been i think it's uh i think they were like at six years into it now wow. or something like that between what they originally started with it as a series and stuff and now yep. making it a feature film and yep. stuff so it's like i think they brought up like i think avatar and like deadpool and a lot of these uh, some of these other projects like those some bigger real big movies like took a long time to yeah. to become where they were and stuff. They have several years of from you know create you know the original creation to yep. to what you the, the theatric release and stuff. So well, I kept telling myself not to force it. Right. You know, it'll it'll be what it is, and it'll take as long as it takes to get made. But at the same time, it's like you know, I got people that donated to the Kickstarter campaign and stuff like that, and that was always in the back of my head as like the biggest push to get it done because mm -hmm. i you know i originally estimated getting this like two years and i didn't want to let people down um in terms of how long it was taking and you know i i hopefully did a good enough job about saying okay you know it's taking a little bit longer but i've you know it's for good reason i got some really cool interviews lined up you know let's hold on a little bit longer sure. <laughs> you know but i think it's a much better product having taken four years and it would have been if it only took two yeah, what can we talk about the Kickstarter some more? Or like, yeah. uh, is, <clears throat> I've only been, uh, a, you know, um, on the other side of it. So yeah. like, uh, but I always find that process really neat. Like, I like being a part of that, especially, um, you know, I've I've done uh, between some other crowdfunding campaign things too. But like, mm -hmm. I've done um, stuff with bands and and different things. Actually, I bought a, a cooler. I did the coolest cooler. That was a Kickstarter. Yeah, uh, the coolest cooler. Yeah, I don't know if you've uh, seen that one, but yeah. I bought that, and that's pretty neat. It's got a um, uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a regular cooler, and so but it also has uh, um, plates and knife in there. It's got uh, a Bluetooth speaker that's also like uh, detachable and stuff, okay. and like it's got. Uh, um, a corkscrew. It's got a bottle opener. All it's the like, necessities. It's got like everything all in nice. one. And it's got a. It's got. Uh, it's got the handle, and you can roll it. And you can. It's got a bungee cord on there, so you can hold everything on top. And it's like got all kinds of little gadgets on it. And uh, but um, it was an idea that that guy had. And like and again, the same kind of thing that you're doing. Yeah. You put it all together, and it made it happen. And then it took a while. I remember like, but it was kind of fun to like. You know, they were giving video updates and stuff like yep. what's happening. But. Um, so I uh, I enjoy that process. I mean, I just like I said, I think it's a cool thing to the people can be a part of the creative process mm -hmm. the whole time. Totally. You know? It's like even if it is three, four years or whatever, like you're saying. Yeah. But like, you know, it's nice to be invested in something and believe in some, a product and like and watch it come to fruition. So. Yeah, yeah. I think it would be dangerous if I would sit there on Kickstarter all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd be throwing money at a whole bunch of stuff. But yeah, it was it. It was an interesting process. Um, it was tough because I don't like asking people for money. Right. You know, and that was the hardest thing. It's like, you know, five bucks. Sure. You know, that's, I mean, that's the whole idea of Kickstarter is you're hoping that you get just a ton of people that invest a little bit of money and it spreads it out. But it wasn't really the case. You know, I had, I had a moderate amount of people investing decent money, mm -hmm. you know, was, was kind of my experience. And, um, you know, it was, it was tough it just from a, I didn't want to like strain relationships or anything like that, but I'm like, I got so many friends that are musicians and engineers and stuff like that. I'm like, Oh, that should be easy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just did a lot of research on to how to, how to best push a Kickstarter campaign. And, you know, it all turned out to be pretty, uh, pretty spot on. I, I wish uh, Martin Atkins uh, just put out a book recently about crowdfunding, but it's mostly for musicians, like how to crowdfund albums and stuff like that. I wish that book was out mm -hmm. before I had done mine because there's a lot of great information in that book. What kind of perks did, were you able to offer? Because I know bands, they do shirts and CDs and yeah, all that. Yeah, that was, that was the toughest part because I didn't want to do anything physical because that's when you start like losing all the money that you made. Mm -hmm. um, so everything was, you know, copies of the film, the uh, soundtrack, all the bands that are 
or all the music in the film is all St. Louis artists. Um, so there's, there's two soundtracks to the film, um, like a side A and a side B, I guess you could say. Um, there was, um, you know, mixing services and things that I threw in like, well, I can, I can't really put in much, but I can put in my time. Right. You know, so I did stuff like that too. I've seen uh, bands do that too, where uh, you could like hire one of them to come like, do your dishes or something, you know, that kind of thing. Like people yeah. get creative, you know, yeah. like whatever, I'll do whatever for a couple of yeah, bucks. And it know, so, yeah, it works. It um, works. But yeah. Uh, so uh, like I said, we got, uh, we have the big uh, screening at the uh, International St. Louis International Film Festival yep. at KDHX on November 3rd. Uh, so you can come on out to that and see Gateway Sound. Um and then hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully when in the next few months and things, keep an eye out. We do have, yeah. um, you said gatewaysoundfilm.com com, correct. And is currently the website and you can get head over there and hopefully we'll, we'll find out some more information, uh, in regards to distribution after that and everything. Um, but I'm guessing, uh, I guess that's just a matter of, uh, yeah, we're, we're talking to a distributor right now, signing contracts and stuff. So mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, hopefully in a matter of time, we'll be up on Amazon and Netflix and Vudu and all those places. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's that's the exciting note to think about that kind of stuff because that's like when, you know, it can take on a whole new life, you know. I feel like yep. that's like not that you're limited to re- right now to St. Louis, but it's uh, just the fact that like that opens up to everywhere, you know, and it's yeah. like so many people might – May just stumble upon it on. Yeah, get- I mean, uh, almost any musician that I talk to, they've seen Dave Grohl's Sound City, yeah. you know. So hopefully, you know, if I can get a quarter of those people, I'll yeah, be happy. <laughs> sure. I uh, I think there's a lot of people interested in this conversation and this just this world, you know, between, um, you know, whether it's the film version or the just the you know, audio studio version and things too. So we getting to getting to discuss all that stuff and seeing it all kind of come to life and things. So yep. Um, I. Uh, but yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited for you, man. I'm I'm, uh, cool. Thanks. I'm, I'm 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 like I said, I really I've watched it. Uh, well, most of it, and uh, I'm excited That's to your finish it for this yeah, evening. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so no spoilers. I don't want to. <laughs> but uh, I I really enjoyed it, and uh, like I said again, it was really just cool to see uh, so many of my buddies are part of this project yeah. as well too. So that was. Um, but uh, yeah, man, I wish you the best. And Appreciate it. I thank you again for all the support and having me out here. This is again. Uh, I really enjoy hanging out here at Smithley. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks, buddy. All right. I'll see you. Rock, paper, podcast. Rock, paper, podcast. Rock, paper, podcast. Rock, paper, podcast. Well, yeah, that was it.